All right, we'll get started, everyone. Um, thank you all for attending tonight's event, Reefs Reawakened. I'd like to start by acknowledging the Ghana people, the original custodians of the Adelaide Plains and the land on which the University of Adelaide's campuses here at North Terrace, at Waite and at Roseworthy are all built. My name is Hayley Parkinson and I'm undertaking my PhD in the School of Biomedicine here at the University of Adelaide and my research area is in multiple myeloma, which is a type of blood cancer, and I'm going to be your MC for tonight. So oyster reefs across Australia were once bustling underwater, underwater metropolises and vital pillars of our marine ecosystems. Unfortunately, now they are pretty much ghost towns. In the past 200 years since colonisation, they've been pushed to near extinction, with over 99% of them being completely degraded. During tonight's presentation, our passionate ecologists will be speaking about their groundbreaking new experiments that utilise sound to boost reef restoration processes. You're going to hear from Dr Dominic McAfee, the Australian Research Council grant-funded researcher in the School of Biological Sciences here at the University. Dom, along with his research colleagues, won the prestigious Eureka Prize for Applied Experimental Research in 2020. And in 2021, he became a South Australian Young Tool Property Award winner. Dom will also be presenting alongside Professor Sean Connell, who co-leads the Food and Water Future Program here at the university. And he plays a pivotal, a pivotal role in advising in governmental decision makers on policy essential for the preservation of marine life in Australia. Sean's research has inspired the restoration of 1.1 kilometres of oyster reefs and has also set in motion new infrastructure to improve coastal water quality. So with that, let's get under, underway and please join me in welcoming Dr. Don McAfee and Professor Sean Connell to the stage. Um, thanks very much, Hayley, for that uh, introduction. And thanks for coming, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here speaking about my favourite topic, uh, oysters, among other things. And we've got a pretty fantastic story for you, I think, tonight. Uh, it's the story about how we've moved from relative amnesia about this ecosystem that once characterised the majority of Australian coastline, over 7,000 kilometres, um, probably a lot more. Uh, of, uh, of, a, of temperate Australian coastline, pretty much from the southern end of the Great Barrier Reef, right down the east coast around Tassie, across South Australia and up to, up to Perth. Um, reefs formed by billions of shellfish living upon one another, oyster reefs, and uh, also formed by mussels, but typically think of them as oyster reefs. These ecosystems were destroyed so quickly following European colonisation that they were soon forgotten about and um, through a process called shifting baseline syndromes, where we remember or where we think habitats are what, they, what we experienced in our youth, um, we rapidly forgot about them. This intergenerational amnesia has set in. And uh, we're starting to, to, to turn a corner now, I hope, in, in this relationship we've had with, with oyster reefs. And hopefully it's a more sustainable future because we've now learned that we can restore them. And from a first contemporary reef restoration in 2015, we're up to about 50 or 60 uh, now, and that's an incredible turnaround from an unknown, forgotten ecosystem to white national action, um, Australia's largest or most widespread marine restoration program. It's a very, very exciting project to be involved in. And uh, the backdrop to this work is, of course, this catastrophic loss of oyster reefs across Australia, but also across the world. And this work was, uh, this particular paper published just in 2011, not long ago at all, was the first time that oyster, that this global scale loss of oyster reefs was, was articulated and visualised. Um, and this image was really influential in my life. I, I, was, uh, I was coming to the end of my undergrad degree. I, I thought, well, I'm not going to get a job, so I'll do honours. I'll do a, uh, oh, I'll do a year of honours at the very least. But what am I going to study? Um, I thought it'd be something to do with ecology. I really thought I'd be in a forest somewhere counting ants. And, um, and there's no hidden message in that. I thought I'd be looking at, at uh, forest ecology. Uh, but I saw this map and realised that there's an incredible story here that not many people know about. And what is going on with this 
ah, functionally extinct, far out, functionally extinct, um, this, this loss of over 99% of oyster reefs in Australia. I grew up, uh, I was born in Perth, but I spent most of my life on the east coast of Australia, where if you go, spend any time on the coast, seeing oysters is a ubiquitous part of your coastal experience. They're everywhere. They carpet the rocks uh, around estuaries and, and on any sheltered cove. And, but this thin veneer of oysters doesn't really represent what these oyster reefs used to be. But these oyster reefs have been doing their thing for a very long time. Oysters have been forming enormous reefs since before the time of the dinosaurs. They've been carpeting sea um, shorelines and rising and falling with sea levels over many years. And, uh, and a good example of this can be found in the outback South Australia, Shell Hill. This is a six metre high fossilised oyster reef, five million years old. It's only a tiny little piece of what used to be there. These reefs, whenever they were found in the last century and a half, were mined and the shell was crushed to create fertilizer and, and chicken feed. Uh, but thankfully, they left this little one. And you can see where these oysters had worms and bryozoans burrowing into their shells five million years ago on the sea floor. Now, instead, they're supporting outback spiders and, and trees. Um, an incredible ecosystem engineer. So oysters have been doing their thing for a long, long time. They've survived multiple mass extinctions. They're incredibly resilient marine ecosystems. But humans have come along in the last, uh, over the last few million years, and we've been doing our thing for a long time and interacting with oysters for, for a very long time. Multiple human species, including Homo erectus, Neanderthals, Homo rudolfensis, which I haven't stuck in there yet, um, have been engaging and using oysters for various reasons for a very, very long time. And uh, this is work I've been doing for too many years now. I've been reading the about 2,500 published papers on oyster shell middens around the world. Uh, shell middens are the uh, refuge from communities that would eat oysters and use their shells and then leave them in piles and then they'll get buried and, or left in caves and archaeologists have been studying them over the last few hundred years. Um, but it shows us that we've had a very long engagement, long standing relationship and love of oysters. They haven't really loved us back because, uh, because we, it's pretty much been a destructive relationship thus far. We know uh, one of the reasons why we've been so attracted to, to oysters for a long time is because oysters, there's a few quirks they have. For one, they're a really nutritious um, food source, really good brain food. And of course, they can't run away, which is really handy. Instead of chasing a mammoth, you can just go pick a few oysters. That's smart risk management in terms of meeting your nutritional needs. They're also the only animal to produce uh, precious gems, and they've been influencing human material culture for a very long time. For tens of thousands of years, indigenous people have used um, shells, uh, oyster, or oyster shells, but also the pearls in, in cultural adornment. Um, they're a really good building material. A lot of the early dredging that, was, um, that destroyed the reefs in Australia was to dredge the oysters for food, but also to burn the shell to manufacture um, cement, to, to create cement. When you burn shell, you can make something called quick lime. So lots of colonial Australian buildings are actually laid down with oyster cement. And of course, they're really delicious and nutritious and um, readily accessible. So all these quirks combined to, uh, and, and resulted in a real intense relationship between humanity and, and oyster reefs. And that's represented by these shell middens. This just looks like a hillside. It's actually billions and billions of oyster shells eaten over thousands and thousands of years. It's an enormous amount of shells and it's hard to fathom how big the ecosystems would have been to support that sort of harvesting over such a long time. And also the depths of time in which people have interacted with these, with these oyster reefs. There's demonstrations of using oyster shell for monumental um, building of, of, of architecture. All around the South American coast, you have these shell mounds, which were really important cultural meeting places where communities would come together. Their dead would be buried in there, and they're important sites of, uh, for important rituals. 
these really sophisticated buildings dot much of the uh, west, southwest, uh, southeast coast of America and also in Japan. Really elaborate structures, some of them functioning as aqueducts. Um, and, uh, and many huge mounds, which we now recognize as islands, are actually shell middens that have subsequently been reclaimed by vegetation growing atop these, these shells. So we have this really long-standing but largely destructive relationship with uh, shellfish reefs. And just to give you a bit of local context, I'm going to pass over to Sean now. So my journey, uh, my journey with oyster reefs came from working with Heidi Alloway, who was a PhD student of mine. She was walking around the Department of Transport and Infrastructure in their archives and uh, found that uh, there was a debate among the locomotive engineers in England about how to modify the trucks that the uh, steam engine that was being brought out to South Australia, how they should tow oyster shell around the state. And uh, we thought this was very odd because oysters in South Australia don't exist except for in Coffin Bay. We're famous for our Coffin Bay oysters, but they certainly don't produce enough to actually fill up whole trucks and large numbers of trucks be towed around the state. We knew there were native oysters around, but in that quantity, you saw those middens that um, Dom showed before. It beggars belief that there would be so much shell in this state that it would warrant the engineers to worry about this on such a scale that they did. And then she discovered this map. So I'm not going to try and not the pointer. Top you, button. Uh, top button. Thank you, Dom. And then I've gone black. <laughs> she uh, found this map here. And what you're looking at is this is the Fleury Peninsula, Cape Jeffs down here, Adelaide. They closed down these gulfs to allow the oyster beds to recover. But what had happened is they had mined so much of the oysters that there was a general panic about this resource being mined to no longer being economically viable. In fact, our economy in South Australia was very much based on oysters. It was critical for construction, our roading, and it had been taken to such an extent that it looked like it wasn't a sustainable future. And so before our Houses of Parliament, before our own Parliament here in South Australia, was constructed. The first law in South Australia was passed in the Houses of Common to actually regulate this industry. And in this case here, what you can see is we closed down the top half of the Gulf here to oyster fishing so that they could recover in the bottom half. And the idea was to flip that over so they could recover and we'd have a sustainable industry. As it happens, it wasn't sustainable and it crashed. What that's led us to is what you're seeing here is this is the Adelaide coastline here. And Dom and I have been working on restoring, and you can see the reefs that we've been built through here. This is our boat coming with divers uh, to work out how to restore these reefs. We went to uh, our policymakers in the state here, Heidi and I, to say, well, it would be a nice idea if we could bring back this ecosystem. There's a whole bunch of fantastic functions they bring back. Fish, they clean up the water column. And what led us on this journey of trying to work out how to bring them back was this idea that, yes, the government would actually help us put down the building blocks to put the system back, but we were terribly worried that it was an extinct ecosystem that we're trying to bring back from extinction, which meant there was going to be a lot of science. And it was going to be done on a coast which is notorious, globally famous, for having lost ecosystems. So we've transitioned from kelp forests to turf forming reefs, from seagrass loss to sand. The scale of devastation is extraordinary. but and through the research done through my colleagues in the past at the University of LA and myself, have been able to bring in processes which have brought these systems back. We rank third best in the world at bringing back seagrasses. The amount of seagrasses that we have brought back through regulating water quality and improving our wastewater treatment plants has been phenomenal. 
So on the back of the success story, in which we've also brought back kelp forests, we're wondering how we could bring back an extinct ecosystem. The concern was great because if you think about the thylacine, and we were given the opportunity to bring them back in Tasmania, and we could do that on a scale we're talking about hundreds, maybe thousands, tens of thousands, maybe 100, 300,000, there are a whole bunch of consequences you need to think through. And they're going to be biological, ecological, economic, and social. And so at this point, I'm going to hand back to Dom. These were the sorts of things we were worried about, that if we were going to get funding to bring back this ecosystem, what were we bringing back? Um, so those, the, the historic oyster reefs, they were oyster upon oyster upon oyster upon oyster, or mussel upon mussel. And as we dredged all those, all those um, oyster beds out, the, we, we removed every single oyster indiscriminately. That's what the dredges do, they're very effective. So there was nothing left. We transitioned from a shell substrate to a sandy substrate. And those restless shifting sands didn't provide any hard, um, hard substrate for new oysters to settle on the hard substrate and then start to regenerate these reefs. So the first step in trying to bring back this lost ecosystem was to provide suitable hard substrate. And we looked at a bunch of different types of substrate. Um, this was a very sort of pioneering project. It hadn't been done before in Australia. Uh, but we could look to America and look at the, the strategies they, they use over there. So in, in the US, they've been restoring oyster reefs for about 50 years. But that's because that's the way that the oyster aquaculture is done. They have a more traditional harvesting method where they restore reefs and then re-harvest um, re them. Uh, but that, that uh, aquaculture created an incredible amount of research and development in and of itself. And in the late 90s, they thought, well, why not restore reefs and not harvest them? And that was, the, the, I guess, the birth of, of the modern day um, oyster reef restoration movement in the world. Uh, Australia is now playing catch up, uh, but we could take the lessons learned in the US and use that as a bit of a template. So first, we needed to build hard substrate. And uh, as a fantastic demonstration of, of collaboration between scientists and industry and government, we came together and worked out that limestone substrate Building reefs made out of quarried limestone was probably the best solution to provide hard substrate that's not going to wash away. Limestone is also made of similar material to oyster shells. And oysters, little baby oysters, they can actually smell a good place to live. They've got a whole bunch of, cute, um, of uh, tricks up their sleeve. They, can ha they have some sort of rudimentary sight. And they can also smell. Smells are really important, attractive for choosing a place to live. So limestone was an appropriate substrate to use. Um, so I'll take you underwater and we'll have a look at what these reefs look like when they're first constructed. Lots of beautiful substrate. Um, this is just within a few weeks of, of putting these boulders down at, at Glenelg. And uh, that's a lot of nooks and crannies for oysters to find the place to live. And there's a human, that's Zach, um, a former honours student. And within, um, but it's not just oysters who are looking for a place to live. Coastal seas, particularly productive ones, are a soup of propagules looking for, looking for a place to settle down and live. So within two months, we, 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 um, we saw this emergence of turfing algae. This is a global issue that on modified coastlines, on modified coastlines around the world, um, where you have particularly uh, neutrified um, waters, where you've got a lot of urban runoff, these turfs can really thrive. And they capture sediment that's, that's also increased by urbanization. And that forms a barrier um, to other things. So you can see after four months, that turf is actually really pretty thick. And that's hard for an oyster to, to negotiate to get in. That's a, that's a solid barrier. And, the first reef that was constructed, um, we didn't know much about the biology or ecology of oysters. We didn't know when they were going to be in the water column. So the first reef was constructed in the middle of winter when there were no oysters actually out in the water looking for a place to live. 
By the time that they started to recruit in the, in the spring, there was already this thick layer. So it's hard to, uh, and there's still a legacy of that today. The oysters are slowly getting onto the top of that reef. But since then, we've started constructing these reefs right when we know the oysters are the, the um, peak recruitment. And to, but irrespective of putting boulders in at the right time, you need to make sure that the oysters have the best chance of, of finding these reefs as soon as possible. So that they use sight um, in very, very limited capacity. They use smell where they can smell other oysters. We don't have, have other oysters on these reefs yet. But they also use sound. At the largest scales, sound is an environmental cue that's actually really important for, for oysters. And, and marine environments are incredibly noisy places. Um, the sounds of the sea are composed of lots of different, lots of different things. We've got, of course, human, the human component, but we've got, uh, we've got mammals making um, iconic sounds that we associate with the sea, but not too many of us, nobody thinks too much about the sounds associated with habitats and the habitats we're interested in are these um, bottom habitats formed by uh, kelp, formed by seagrass, formed by coral reefs, but also formed by oysters. And they have a pretty characteristic sound, which is formed by a whole bunch of critters going about their daily business. That sizzling bacon sound is, um, is, a, is a menagerie of uh, all sorts of animals rasping at the sea floor, eating and crawling about. But it's pri the primary culprit are these snapping shrimp. And they find a home in really complex habitats where they can, where they can live in, in high densities. They have a modified claw that snaps shut really fast. It's one of the fastest movements known in the animal kingdom. It's actually so fast that it creates this tiny flash of light. It's a really violent um, process. And one snap is quite loud, but when you have lots and lots and lots of snapping shrimp living all together, then that can create that real crackling cacophony that is very, um, very much characteristic of a healthy, of a healthy habitat. So what does sound do? Well, as that sound then travels away from the reefs, it, it has a bunch of different functions. So we have this, this soup of things looking for a place to live. We've got oysters, we've got larval fish, we've got all sorts of things. And they use sound as, uh, as a means of orientation. What's up, what's down, what's left, what's right. Um, they also use it to distinguish what's potentially a healthy habitat from a not so healthy one. So they use it for habitat selection. And we've actually played these different sounds, the sounds of sedimentary plains, seagrass beds, rocky reefs, degraded reefs and, and really healthy reefs. We've played those different sounds to oyster larvae in the lab and found their favorite tunes to listen to. Um, and when they find something they like, they will drop out of the water column, sink to the seabed and, and cement themselves to the floor where, if they can. And then they metamorphose in from a larvae that's free swimming into a settled adult and they're, they're down for life. So it's a pretty important decision to make. So as we've lost these biological habitats around the world, these habitats formed by oysters and seagrass, we've also, as, as habitats have degraded, we've also lost the sound that's associated with them. And that creates this thing called a feedback loop where you have less recruitment. That means the habitat remains degraded and we have this continual loss of sound and recruitment and a general decline in the health of the habitat. But what we think we can do, what we hope we can do is that through habitat restoration, we can start to reverse that process. We can reintroduce those foundations that increase the, the, the richness of, um, of the soundscape to influence the number of recruits. Um, but we're pretty impatient humans and we need to get these things done quickly. So one of the strategies we've been doing is actually increasing the sound artificially by playing the favorite soundtrack of these oysters using underwater speakers. And that, uh, we hoped, would have a market effect on the amount of recruits we were getting reversing this feedback loop. Thanks, Dom. A good summary. Uh, when we, I'm just going to put a human angle into this. 
when we finally got the funding to uh, do a pilot study, I started to lose sleep because I thought, well, you saw those rocks on the sea floor there, and you saw the turfs, which we know in human-dominated systems tend to dominate. And I thought, what if we end up putting rocks on the sea floor, which are going to be seaweed-dominated? Just have those weedy type of species there. This is an extinct ecosystem. We don't see these oysters everywhere. In fact, they're very rare to see. How were we going to get them to colonise these reefs? We had approached, the Nature Conservancy had approached an aquaculture firm to actually create larvae that we could put onto the reef. You set all these larvae out onto oyster shells and you put the oyster shells onto the reef. Our calculations not only showed it was a very expensive process but a very long process. At mortality rates in the marine environment where you have these swarms of larvae moving around that then attach the mortality rates are exceptional, about 99.9%. .9%. And so we could be looking at oyster reefs occurring 10, 20 years away. So you might be a brave minister and announce that you would fund something like this, but you wouldn't in your own lifetime potentially, certainly not in your political career, see the benefits of this. This is an intergenerational project. And people aren't patient. Election cycles are quick, and the people who make these decisions aren't going to be around to actually see the benefits and these projects could be stranded in time. So I worried about this out loud to multiple people about how were we going to bring back this ecosystem. And Dom's explained how these larvae will use sight, chemical cues and sound. And it was actually Tudio Rossi here, um, who's a fantastic entrepreneur who had been working with me on using sound and the silencing of the oceans that we're seeing, ocean acidification and warming, we're losing species, which actually are the sound producers, what that future would look like. And he wondered, could we actually put that sound back into the water? When I looked into this, it was an expensive exercise. The commercial equipment that's required to do that on the scale of bringing back reefs that we're talking about of a kilometre long was prohibitively expensive. And so I spoke about this to Alan Noble, the ex-CEO of Google Australia New Zealand. And he has a startup company uh, called Oz Oceans, which manufactures equipment. And he said, why don't we see if we could go to Bunnings and make these underwater speakers? Perhaps we can actually get parts from electronic companies and Bunnings and provide a blueprint for the world to be able to make their own water, underwater speakers for tens of dollars. In fact, we can make them for $50. And so by rubbing these two people together and the ideas together, we went and tested this. It sounds like it's been a very simple process from A to B to C, but it was a very convoluted process of testing and getting things wrong, which ended up setting up raceways, race water tracks, which are in the building next door in the basin, in the basement in the aquarium, to work out whether the larvae could hear and even move towards sound. We didn't know that was even possible. That was a breakthrough that has rewritten biology. So to get to, to, to create this technology and have it work is one thing, but to know that these creatures can actually respond to sound when they don't have ears, how was that even possible? Uh, this is the sort of rigs that um, Alan's crew made up, where we have a floating platform with solar panels that power the speakers that we put down on, onto, onto the shore. Uh, if you go onto YouTube, you can type in Oz Ocean and it'll take you to some of the videos that are live streamed to your computer or TV. So he can actually make cameras very cheaply and bring what's happening underwater to your desktop. And as Dom's explained, we have been playing underwater music, and we're right at the beginning of this. It was just remarkable to find that if we played natural sounds from healthy areas, healthy kelp forests, that we could actually take the swarms of larvae that are out there. We don't know how much is out there. Remember, there's only one every now and again. I can swim around an area of this room and not find one. I'd have to swim around multiple sizes of this room and maybe I'll find one, and that's a really good feeling. So these are very sparsely distributed, but they make large numbers of larvae 
Dom can explain it. He's a fantastic oyster biologist, the best in Australia. We're very lucky to have him here in South Australia. They may, he can tell you how they produce so many that it would be a fantastic ability to be able to draw those few which are normally lost at sea on an annual basis for the last 200 years down to the oyster reefs that we've created for them to be their home. We don't have data here to show you because that's boring, but what we have done is multiply the amount of recruitment by up to a thousand times. And this is an important graph. There's a speaker. You can see it's really Bunnings made. It's just basically your PVC pipes glued together with uh, some, some bit of uh, hardware from um, uh, electronic shops, which we can make reverberating noises that mimic oyster reefs of the, of the past. So we think that we were there. But this, this graph is actually important because what it shows is that where we have lots of natural recruitment, the speakers aren't doing very much. So here's your control, no speaker. Here's your speaker in the green, the top here. But as you move down towards this area here where you're getting less and less natural recruitment, we are increasing the recruitment relative to controls by a large amount. We're looking at about 10 here, an average of 10 here, but more about 20 here, and then we're up to about 40 to 60 through here. That's a, that's a phenomenal graph showing that where we need it most, we can boost recruitment most. And our analyses have shown that we can actually boost recruitment in these places which are most in danger of not being successful to such a degree that we can promise an oyster reef within an election cycle. Uh, this has been taken up wonderfully around the world. Uh, we wrote an article for the conversation. Uh, it's been in a, a fabulous journal um, from uh, the British Ecological Society. And we've loved how um, social media have got onto this. And this comment's great. People are wondering, what are they playing down there in South Australia? Is it Pearl Jam? And this person's gone, oh, I'll let you read that. But come on, Baleen. Yeah, Im importantly, when I did that tweet, I didn't tell them what we were playing because um, they were very disappointed when they found out. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of opportunities for us to do very cool research. I don't know if anyone's aware of if you play certain music to cheese, for example, you can create funkier cheese by playing hip hop as opposed to Mozart or Led Zeppelin. <laughs> Um, sound is amazing. It, it, it triggers so many responses at the most fundamental biological levels that we wouldn't really think possible unless we do this crazy science. Um, but it, going back to what Sean was saying and that lost sleep, uh, before we constructed Windera Reef, uh, I dived on the site to have a look, you know, to find how many oysters were out there, what sort of reproductive stock, what sort of adults would be there to see the recovery. And there was one adult oyster per 300 meters squared. Uh, so very sparsely spread. Um, but these oysters are highly fecund, highly reproductive. Um, they're a brooding oyster, the flat oyster. That means that it draws in uh, sperm and it actually broods the babies inside the shell. And it can brood three to five million till they're competent and ready to go to school or get a job. And then mum opens up and away they go and they are quite ready and active uh, to be able to swim and interpret and interact with environmental cues and find a home to live. Um, so that three to five million being released by a single mum seems to have been sufficient. And they're also sequential hermaphrodites. That means they can switch between male and female almost on a daily basis. They're crazy beasts. Um, but uh, that means that just those few oysters were able to see this massive recovery. And we're talking about, uh, so, so we, there was some spat on shell, as, as we call it, uh, where we breed oysters in the hatchery, we put shell in there, and then we plant those shells out on the reef. And seven million shells were planted, seven million baby oysters were planted. Um, but within the first few months of the boulders going down at Glenelg, it was probably about three or four hundred million oysters that settled just out of the wild. So there is, there are individuals here and there able to seed this recovery. And just a couple of months ago in May, last time I was diving on the reef, um, I did a count and it's the density of large adults, 
after two and a half years is actually, is actually higher than our sole remaining reference reef, our sole remaining natural reef, which is down in Tasmania. It's the only surviving flat oyster reef um, from that historic dredging. And it's in this really narrow, dangerous neck of water in, in Tasmania, which is why it wasn't harvested um, completely then, but it is still commercially harvested. But the reef we have at Glenelg actually has a higher density of oysters. So we can talk about restoring <coughs> an ecosystem from functional extinction within two and a half years, which is quite a phenomenal story. And these sorts of uh, bright spots, as they're called in, in the scientific literature, are emerging in marine restoration. There's a lot of optimism uh, which didn't, probably didn't exist 10 to 15 years ago. But remember that marine restoration is a fairly novel <coughs> idea. It's a fairly novel concept um, in, in contemporary society. So people have been restoring habitats on land for uh, professionally for a few decades. But doing that at sea is really logistically challenging. Um, you've got to spend time with, with expensive infrastructure to get off and un off the coast and under the water uh, with heavy machinery. So we're really still in our infancy, but we're seeing these massive, massive recovery, as Sean talked about. We've restored, uh, there's been an 11,000 hectare gain in seagrass over the last 30 years in South Australia. We're seeing kelp forests that were lost 20 years ago start to come back. And by providing the right foundations, we can also bring back oysters. And that has generated a lot of optimism. But even before we saw those ecological, that ecological recovery, we noticed that these projects, this restoration project, just really drew people in. And there was a lot of collaborators who wanted to get involved and give their time, free, in-kind um, uh, commitments to helping make this, this, this work a success. So we wrote a paper about that, about how people are drawn to optimism. And conservation optimism is a very real thing. It, it's important, I think, because restoration has this capacity to bring people together. And it, it provides a really valuable narrative for, for humanity that no matter how bad things are and how bad things have been in the past, if we work together, we have the capacity to improve the health of our natural environment. And by doing that, also, improve our own health. So restoration can turn ecological grief and dismay into hope and agency. And that's a powerful and important message in this day and age. And we're seeing really fantastic examples of how that optimism is infused through, infusing through wider society, which is really encouraging. For example, we've got great programs like the Seeds for Snapper program, where People walk along. I mean, this is this is the sort of activity I would be doing anyway on a summer's uh, summer's weekend with my with my little daughters Adelaide and Madeline. Would be walking along, fossicking for shells or moon sack eggs, um, moon sack snail eggs. Um, but what people can do is also collect seagrass seedlings and deposit them at certain locations, and then that's stock used to restore restore seagrass meadows. In, in uh, Moreton Bay in Brisbane, Ozfish have a program to restore what will be the largest oyster reef in Australia, 100 hectares. They're aiming for 100 hectares within 10 years, all run by community volunteers, building these, you can't, it's a terrible picture, but building these um, gabion cages, which are filled with recycled oyster shell, uh, which are then planted by, by community members. Here's a school group. Just, deploying these, these reefs. And, and this is a picture of um, the um, King's Coat Men's Shed, where these, these fellows are getting, get, getting together to build these structures which are, which are forming part of the restoration program uh, on, um, on Kangaroo Island. So there's these really exciting community-led initiatives emerging. And I'd certainly like to see more of that. So Dom and I, spent a lot of time thinking about how to make the science useful and, uh, and how we can turn around our habitats to bring back what we had before so that we have some agency over ourselves as people, uh, as coastal people. And uh, Oz Ocean, I'm a, uh, a director of this company, 
uh, we have actually created online modules for kids to use as part of their work in schools so that it can be marked and they can understand the value of restoration that it's we don't necessarily need to live in a society where every year we have bad news upon bad news piled on us but we have some ability to be able to turn what has been an environmental disaster for the last 200 years at least on our coast but this is a national program and I would hope to think it would give hope globally uh, we, it does attract considerable interest and help at the levels that we need. So these are photographs of um, ourselves going to Parliament. Uh, we just last week I was speaking to Susan Close. Uh, people like Susan and uh, David Spears here are incredibly intelligent, thoughtful activists for the environment. When I spoke to Susan and David, they both could articulate what I'm talking about now with incredible intelligence. We have faith in these people, it's quite extraordinary. Uh, this is the ex-CEO of Onkaparinga um, City Council with her environmental officer here, Nina. Um, and this is Julia, uh, um, Julia, and I'm, I can't remember her surname, I have to apologize. And they both spoke very well about their need to have an oyster reef at O'Sullivan's Beach and how it was created and how it's good for the constituents and how people really enjoy and value it. What we have here is a, a law scholar. Uh, we're looking, working with people around Australia at the moment, law scholars from Queensland, New South Wales, Tasmania, to try and change legislation so it doesn't act as it has as a blockage to restoration, but actually can facilitate community groups that Dom was talking about to give them sort of agency to actually go into the environment to actually improve it. That the permitting processes and the encouragement for people like yourselves can be engaged. And just on the, uh, on the left here is the, a marine biologist who works with Alan Noble who actually was fundamental to actually convincing engineers that this was a good idea. Engineers are interesting geeks. I'm a geek, Dom's an oyster geek, as you have not not already guessed and convince them to open their minds to actually work in a highly collaborative, multidisciplinary space that would make a difference. And I think that is more of the future of the science that we're going to see, where people more and more work outside their sub-sub-disciplines and work with other folk to actually enable change. What science will actually change a decision at the level of these folk here, CEO of councils and the ministers of the environment? What I want to do now uh, is, before we take questions, is Dom and I spend a lot of time in our offices having office conversations about how the science we do will make a difference and how it will engage with people who can make that difference. We're just two people in a small lab and we can't restore these oyster reefs that you're seeing on the scales in which it needs to be done. Yes. South Australia is a global leader in marine restoration. These are the largest marine restorations in the world. And the type of risks that we took to get there were really thoughtfully done and we had the backing. But I think it's actually working with people like yourselves and the broader community that's needed. So I'm gonna just ask Dom some questions that we um, had a discussion today, just to provoke a broader discussion. So Dom, is this a one-off project? Uh, we go, after we move on, will this be just a stranded asset? And if, if not, what will have changed? What would we have done? What needs to be done to make this sustainable at large scales for, a, for the next generations? Mm. Um, well, I obviously hope it's not going to be a one-off project. I want to still be in the job for a start. Uh, but it's, these, are, these are legacy building projects, but I think the risk is that they are offshore and potentially out of sight, out of mind. And I think that definitely would have factored into, it's definitely one of the reasons why South Australia was able to forge ahead rather than the East Coast, because there most of the shellfish reefs are intertidal and that creates a whole suite of other considerable risks. Um, people stepping on oysters, boats mm. running into them as is what happened with the first restoration mm. in, uh, in New South Wales. So. Um, so I think 
everybody was emboldened by the idea that, well, if, if this doesn't go terribly well, it might be forgotten in a few years. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's obviously a terrible approach to conservation. So, so we had a good start in South Australia because our reefs were offshore and deeper water and less of a threat to folk. Uh, but if you, if you look up at that screen, uh, even though that's what, about five hectares, we need to add more to that. So what we're looking at here is a southern beach where in the top corner here, we had whole scale kelp loss um, as a consequence of a wastewater treatment plant that was over here and it's pumping nitrogen into the water. And those weedy species that you saw before took over the seagrasses, the seagrasses died, we lost huge quantities of seagrass and the kelp forests, which are now coming back in an extraordinary way. Now that is an intervention on land for which the engineers have been able to create and will be ongoing. But for oyster reefs, it needs something a little bit more active. How, how do we roll this out so that we have more and more of these covering more and more of the coastline? Well, definitely education is an important part to make sure that people are aware and can value these ecosystems. Um, that they're not just an environmental curiosity, but they're something that are actually fundamentally important. More oysters equates to more fish. That's part of people's livelihood. It also improves water quality. That's part of people's enjoyment of nature, um, of, of spending time on the coast. So it, it might take quite some time, but a more widespread culture around ecosystem restoration is, I think, what we need. And we're seeing the first steps of that. Um, with with these with with Ausfish and these different con restoration initiatives, which are national and emerging and gaining momentum, most of them are only a few years old. But how do we get more people to engage in that? Yeah, you were mentioning people going to the beach for a walk. Yeah, you could go for a walk and grab some seeds for snapper. And that's about education, knowing yeah. that those opportunities exist first and foremost, and when there are very specific times when you need to do uh -huh. that. The seagrass wash ashore, but they'll be dead within six hours of, of uh -huh. washing ashore. Uh -huh. So there are specific times to go and enjoy the beach and collect mm -hmm. a few seagrass <laughs> at the same time, if you're that <laughs> way inclined. I think that um, one of the major hurdles, which will probably hopefully it will be solved, there's no guarantee it will, will be addressing modernity's dualism that of people apart from nature. Uh, I think mm -hmm. if people can appreciate that, that habit, healthy habitats and ecosystems are fundamental to our security, uh, mm. our social uh, well-being mm. and our mm. mental well-being, um, then that's going to be potentially the inspiration needed for people to engage with, with projects and, and make engaging in restoration a normal part of, mm -hmm. um, of, of coastal living. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I also think that if people are attracted to and support these endeavours, that will mean that the decision makers will feel greater legitimacy to take on these projects. Uh, the risk of bringing back the thylacine, for example, is something that really worried me is with oyster reefs, what happened if we did make a mistake? Would the general public forgive that mistake? Would that stop politicians from being emboldened to take these risks? Uh, when I speak to people, they say, oh, we wouldn't do that because there is less risk of doing nothing than there is in doing something. But here we have a, a world leading example where we can embolden those risk takers to actually take something more on. But I think that only comes from having a forgiving public, mm. uh, that people understand this. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and there's a lot of discussion around the role of ocean literacy and how that can support social license for governments to make mm -hmm. bold decisions. Um, so what do you mean by so, um, literacy? What does that ocean mean? literacy, uh, understanding the role that, that uh, that healthy habitats play, uh -huh. healthy coastal habitats play, and and the connection between our behaviour on land mm -hmm. and at sea, uh, uh, with healthy functioning coastal systems. Hmm. Coastal systems do so much that we don't, that we're not really aware of, and I think there's a general perception that the restoration work we do is about um, restore, you know, helping 
plant and animal communities thrive mm. in a human-dominated world. It's much more than that. It's, it's, uh, humans are really, human values are, are central to restoration mm. projects. Mm. Um, so recognizing that when we're healing nature, in a sense, we're also healing ourselves. Mm. Mm. And there's, of course, physical and mental uh, well-being and social well-being benefits from engaging in conservation or restoration projects. That's been demonstrated in the literature. So communicating those opportunities, mm -hmm. but also facilitating those opportunities mm. uh, through programs like Seeds for Snapper mm. is... So it's as much about people as it is about the environment. Mm. Mm. Where do you think we will be in a hundred years oh. of this? Uh, well, I'm, I'm quite an optimistic thinker. Uh, you have to be when, when you can see that despite pushing these ecosystems to the brink, we're able to bring them back when we have the, the will. And uh, these are not expensive projects that we've mm. worked on. That largest reef, the, the, the reef at, the, at Glenelg, the first construction was about $1.6 million. That's just you know a few new chairs yeah. in Parliament, um, or or a, or a new footpath in Norway. Um, so the it's reasonable to think that governments could embrace mm. these projects with a, a restoration, an annual restoration fund, mm. for example, mm. um, unspent dollars. And uh, I'd like to think that that we, we've made a lot of progress. This is the very beginning. But I don't see why we couldn't repair much of the coastline mm. where it's needed um, over the coming decades. Mm. And we'll eventually start to see that feedback loop switch in the mm. other direction. Mm. I'm hoping that we'll have sustainable societies, cleaner material cultures, less consumerism or smarter consumerism mm. rather than less. Mm. Mm. So Hayley, um, maybe other people want to join the conversation. Well, to start with, I just want to thank you both. That was really, really interesting. And I mean, for me personally, it's really exciting to see how your research um, is contributing to this um, restoration process. And it's really fantastic to hear. So thank you for that. Um, so yeah, we'll open up the floor um, for questions. To get the ball rolling, I'll um, first ask you a pre-submitted question, which was by Helen. Um, so she asked, will the state continue to build oyster reefs along the Adelaide coastline? Uh, I I would hope so. Uh, one of the, one of the so when I spoke to people about playing music to restore oyster reefs, they did think I was a bit crazy. And my boss, the dean of science at the time, said to me, "Why don't you just go out and dangle crystals in the ocean, Sean?" Uh, so my latest crazy idea that I'll share with you is that. Um, the ability for oyster reefs to clean up the environment in terms of clarifying the water column does a job that uh, engineering equipment on land does. And the costs and the investment is extraordinary. We've spent $900 million in South Australia. That's your wastewater utility bills. That's the SA water utility bills we all pay. A portion of that goes to not just maintaining that equipment, but also improving on it so we reduce the pollutants going into the water. It's reducing nitrogen, which is the fertilizer, which makes, these, makes the water turbid, the plant life takes off, less clean, less safe to, work, to live in, and plants tend to go into these more simplistic forms of going to sand from seagrass. Oyster reefs being lost, they're actually mined out, and the, uh, t the kelp forest being lost because these turfs are taking over. So maybe, we could actually spend some of that money on equipment and put it into oyster reefs instead. Maybe there's a point where we get to where nature is the solution rather than engineering being the solution. And there might be a sustainable economic model where we see that on an annual basis, we're spending some millions of dollars bringing these systems back rather than relying on engineering solutions on land, which is very expensive. Is there anyone in the audience with a question? We've got some roving mics here, so there's just one at the back and then a couple down the front here. 
Thank you very much for a very illuminating talk. I'm a long-term person, you can tell by the colour of my hair. I grew up in Adelaide without really knowing too much about what's going in the, under the sea. But I moved away and then I've come back. And the dramatic changes one sees is there's no seagrass. At Seacliff there used to be mounds of it. And my father used to, perhaps illegally, go down there with a trailer because he knew that it was a good fertiliser and no one stopped him. But, so, th there, there is this thought that you, you're trying to get the public to be educated about what's going on. And I'm thinking even, okay, you, you had your underwater speakers. What about an underwater camera or two, which is fed to a website and which the ABC occasionally plays a few pictures as a screenshot, uh, we could download it on our computers, kids could do it. And so we, we would become more aware because I'm frankly astonished that one could do such things that you have described. And <coughs> then too, um, I've had slight interest in underwater phenomenon related to what submarines and detections, etc., of them. And the underwater noise environment has become extremely important to understand uh, what noises there are there and whether they are natural or not. Uh, then too, I think of the, uh, the jetty at Brighton, which has got its Telstra tower at the end. That is an object which stands out. So why couldn't we have some buoys of, a, of an attractive colour and approved by the uh, marine, whoever authority, somewhere near your reefs and you could say to your kids or grandkids look out there that's that's where our artificial reefs are because frankly um i would say 10 percent of us here only knew about it maybe less i don't know uh, you could ask people to put up their hands here if you wanted to and and i that's all i could, i could say more but someone else might like to say something right do you want to put steve house and the bridge up in steve house Bring it back in the shore. Sure, sure. The shore. Um, but first, uh, how many people knew about these oyster reefs before they came here? Oh, yeah. You're about right. Uh, in terms of the, the seagrass question, um, so there was a about a five to six thousand hectare loss from poor wastewater uh, or sewage disposal uh, about the mid 20th century. And over the last 30 years, as I mentioned, we're seeing, after wastewater treatment upgrades, we're see, we've seen this 11,000 hectare recovery. Uh, but it can only recover in less than 10, uh, more than 10 metres of water. So any closer to the shore, uh, there's, there's just too much hydrodynamic activity for, it to, for, for the seedlings to take root. Uh, so part of our work is looking at whether or not these reefs are a solution rather than um, further upgrades to wastewater treatment which, which has clearly done a fantastic job we're seeing the kelp come back we're seeing the seagrass come back but how can we bring back the seagrass into the near shore and we think that these reefs might provide a solution because they do provide just enough hydrodynamic dampening to allow the little seedlings to, to get a foothold and we are seeing seedlings start to emerge around the reefs after about a year and a half of them being in the water. Um, did you want to take the... We obviously took the wrong slides out because there, there are some slides that would have spoke directly to your, to your next question. Did you want to feel that, Sean? No, I'm happy to. Uh, what, was it about cameras or multi species? Uh, cameras. Uh, I'm thinking about the signage at Cornell. Oh, OK. Um, so the, one of the things that Dom and I are working on is multi-species restoration, moving beyond monocultures, making sure that we're bringing back the old abalone stocks that were with these reefs, the, the, the kelp forests, the seagrasses, they're all one system. The ecosystem was joined together in a fully functioning way. This particular location would have had all that. Uh, we, we hear of accounts of the abalone being in such thick numbers and they're probably a very, very important creature on these reefs. Um, at Glenelg, we have some signage out there which alerts people walking along 
Uh, you can scan your photo of the QR code and it'll take you to the website of the Nature Conservancy that'll explain something about this, but clearly we're not doing enough to bring this to people's attention, so it's very good to know that. And just finally, with the underwater cameras, that is something that we've been trying to do with those rigs, um, putting the cameras under the water so people could see the development of the reefs. The engineering behind that is still in its infancy because the marine environment's brutal on electronic equipment. And so it doesn't last so well. We've got a really long way to go with being able to bring this underwater vision to people's living rooms and the classroom, which is an aim of ours. Uh, but uh, it has taken years to get to a very infant point. We're just at that beginning. It's a good point. Thank you. Uh, uh, one of the exciting collaborations we have with Oz Ocean is, is going into classrooms and actually getting the students to build the underwater cameras and to build the speakers themselves as, as part of the um, uh, engineering unit. And for example, in Port Adelaide, uh, Portside Christian College have, have constructed their own their own rigs, their own cameras, and deployed those over over some of the reefs. So that that was championed by you know a couple of individuals who've then moved on from those positions, and that's always the the challenge for sustaining uh, these initiatives. When you lose the 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 really passionate people, often programs can fall apart. So um, that's something we're working on sustaining a, a, an, an educational program. Fantastic, they were really great answers. I think we had another couple down the front here. Um, aside from uh, creating a healthy ecosystem, is there an opportunity to strategically locate reefs that would influence the transport of sand along the coastline so we don't have to track it? Yeah. You go. Uh, I, I'm not qualified to answer that. <laughs> uh, I, all I've heard from people I've spoken to is you've got to be enormously careful when you start intervening with sand movement. I think bringing back the seagrass um, would would aid that major challenge of considerable sand movement up and down the, the coast. But you're talking about very large reefs likely required to dampen the wave energy and, and the tidal movement um, that drives a lot of that sand movement. So it's, uh, I'd, I'd be hesitant to champion constructing really large reefs which alternate the hydrology of our coast because we don't know what downstream impacts that may have. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Dom, for that which you shared. Chris McGuire, economist, Danielle Cross, geographer, so the humanities department of the Prince Alfred College. Wondered if you've got any favourable interest in the Spencer Gulf, particularly the York Peninsula side, for a, re a, a restoration program? Absolutely. Uh, um, Port Broughton? I think is how, how you say it, uh, is, has been identified as a potential first restoration in Spencer Gulf. Um, and there's been some site suitability mapping already done and a little bit of funding that's been driven by the local council. They want a reef there. And if you look at the historic maps, the distribution of oysters is probably not dissimilar to what we see in Gulf St Vincent. We're just missing that beautiful visual element of the historic map showing these were where the oyster reefs were. We have dot points and they're typically up and down the, um, the western coast of Spencer Gulf just as they were here in, in Gulf St Vincent. So massive opportunity to restore uh, Spencer Gulf as well. Uh, and I've actually Last week, I think it was, I lose track of time, I was in Coffin Bay um, setting up a, uh, starting to take the first steps to set up a, a citizen science program to start to restore the reefs that once carpeted. We know they carpeted because of the sheer volume of shell that came out. They must have dominated the ecosystem, but there's no maps. And uh, so we need to piece together that ecological history to provide the legitimacy to then go take it to the next level. Thanks. Thanks for the presentation. 
Um, there, there's a push on for an annual recreational fishing license. And I'm just wondering if you could comment on which recreational species might benefit most from these reefs really getting going again, because then I feel that might be able to lead to some kind of marketing campaign and funding source to help. Snapper. Uh, so work on the East Coast, really excellent work has shown that the majority of the recreational fish, um, favourite fish, which were targeted by a, a number of researchers, uh, by, by a number of studies by my colleagues, uh, show much stronger affinity of the recreational fish with oyster reefs than with seagrass, mangroves, other, other habitat types. So um, when I was working up and down the east coast, I'd regularly see uh, in an individual oyster shell thousands and thousands of fish eggs. They, a lot of them lay their eggs directly onto the shells or they breed above them. They're nursery habitats where the little juveniles grow up and they then graduate to offshore reefs. Um, but certainly the fishing is very good I hear above Windra Reef at the moment and I imagine there's a whole suite of fish including snapper that are going to benefit from the construction of these reefs. Um, the original motivation was fish productivity in the state. And the motivation differs all around the, the country. It's uh, about shoreline protection in parts of the East Coast, very much so in the US. Also water, massive water quality issues in the US. That's what's driven a lot of the restoration there. Uh, but the fish producing potential of these reefs is really exciting for South Australia. So I think we've got an online question just up here. I've got two quick online questions. Uh, one person's asking, do you see oyster farmers as stakeholders in that project? And how do you envision th this restoration effect versus oyster farming? Oyster farmers are absolutely key stakeholders. Um, and we've worked very well with oyster farmers uh, in, in in um, Gulf St Vincent thus far. It's been absolutely critical having them at the, at the table to, to co-design the restoration work and make sure that the biosecurity protocols around these restorations are incredibly tight because uh, there's livelihoods at stake. If, uh, if somebody eats, if somebody were to harvest a wild oyster and, it, and, and get sick from it, then it could have reverberations for the entire oyster industry. So we're constantly in communication with oyster farmers and some of them have been the greatest champions for these reefs because they see oyster reef restoration as natural research and development um, for, for, for their industry. Um, and there are potential benefits for market diversification. We don't really eat the flat oyster and uh, that's another, it's quite, um, my oyster farmer friend describes it as the boutique beer of the oyster world. You'd have a few, you wouldn't smash them like uh, Pacific oysters, it's the Japanese oyster that we, that we love to eat. Um, but there is definitely, I think there's, there could be a market and it's more or less the same oyster that's consumed in, in Europe and it's much loved over there. So it'd be good to see it on restaurant tables uh, more and there's a real synergy there I think with the, with the aquaculture industry. I don't think it'll threaten the Pacific oyster, which is a very lovely oyster to eat. Uh, the flat oyster is an acquired taste. It's not that bad. <laughs> he bought oyster oh, underwear last week in Coffin Bay. There is nothing oyster that this guy doesn't like. <laughs> I've, got, I've got one last online question. What impact will the rising of water temperatures have on the oyster reefs? or they're quite a resilient species? Uh, extremely resilient and um, by virtue of the fact that they've survived multiple mass extinctions, we know that they are extremely adaptive. I think um, my theory is that they have this incredibly broad genetic toolkit to deal with the highly variable environments in which they may settle. So one flat oyster might settle at 40 metres depth or it could settle near the intertidal. It's a massive range of environmental conditions that, that an individual needs to be prepared to deal with. 
and um, uh, so, so they're, they're always adapting and changing with their environment, but it seems like there hasn't been a lot of genetic change because the oysters, uh, over a long period of time, the oysters in Europe are almost genetically indistinguishable from the oysters in Australia, despite being separated for potentially millions of years. That's because they've got this broad genetic toolkit, I believe, to, to deal with really diverse environments, and that includes um, dealing with the uh, increased CO2 and water temperature experiments that I run in the lab here. They're very, very tough. Um, this is very much leading on from the previous question. Um, I had here about, have you faced many obstacles um, in terms of um, that climate change and ocean acidification, particularly regarding um, where you choose to have these reefs and considering um, the conditions, like whether that's habitable, because you've got the changes in pH levels, which obviously the less carbonate, so they can't develop their shells as well, and things like that. Have you faced many, many sort of large obstacles when it comes to that sort of sort of thing? Um, my major research for a while has been on ocean acidification and calcification of creatures, um, and what we've found is that they are incredibly plastic and able to adapt to ocean acidification. Surprisingly, shells can be made more tougher and robust. Uh, we've gone down to the atomic level to look at how we get at a rearrangement at the nanoscale of, the la of how the uh, material is laid down. It gets laid down differently, stronger and more robust. Uh, and then as you zoom out towards the, uh, the animal itself, they tend to uh, modify their physiology to cope and then as they act as a community there's a whole bunch of um, processes which enable them to, to um, compensate for ocean acidification. Um, as Dom said, um, these are remarkable creatures. Um, if you think of any restoration project that you'd want to get involved in on land or sea, you'd want to do oysters. Can you imagine trying to bring back the Amazon after it's been mowed down? It would take decades, it would take hundreds of years, and if not thousands of years. You would not in your lifetime see your science and your minister benefit from something like that. If you want to do something that's going to um, really turn heads, these crazy creatures that Dom wears on his underpants are the things to work on. Never leave that down. <laughs> Should have told you. That was really fantastic. We might wrap things up there for tonight. So I'd like to obviously thank you both. That was really, really fantastic talks. Um, so please join me in thanking our two wonderful speakers. <laughs> and of course, we also want to thank all of you who came tonight and those of you who watched online as well. We you know, wouldn't be able to do Research Tuesdays without you guys coming and all your wonderful questions. So thank you. Um, so make sure you also sign up for our mailing list to receive um, all the latest info about Research Tuesdays and all the related news. And once again, thank you for tuning in and we'll see you next time. <laughs>